Thank you for watching today's worship service from St. Matthew's Lutheran Church in Stoddard. Our message today is... Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear saints of God who are elect and glorious, in my opinion, the anticipation of some great event in our lives can often be as much as half the fun. Just as an example, maybe you're aware that deer hunting season is coming pretty soon here in Wisconsin. Rifle season, I should be more specific. Now, deer hunters out there could go stop by and grab their license the day before deer hunting season starts, morning of deer hunting, wake up, grab their rifle out of the closet, run out to the deer stand, and start the deer hunting season. But most deer hunters that I know don't do it that way. There is lead up. There is a whole bunch of things in preparation. How often in the weeks leading up to deer season don't you hear hunters talking about this great deer that they saw walking across their land or on one of their trail cams or sighting in their rifle or uh, posting those trail cam shots on Facebook, getting the deer stand ready, making plans to get together with friends or family to go out on the hunt, and of course, piling up the food that's necessary for, for deer hunting. There's a lot of busy work to be done. There's a lot of work involved in that, but all of that work, all of that anticipation adds to the joy of that important day and makes the work light. So by the time opening day rolls around, you've been itching to get out there for weeks. The anticipation of a great event is often half the fun. Looking ahead to God's great judgment day should have a, a similar effect on our lives. God wants it to have a similar effect on our lives. When we live in active anticipation and expectation of God's judgment day, we are filled with eagerness in our hearts to be with the Lord, and we're encouraged in our lives of godly Christian living and service. So when we are looking ahead and preparing for God's judgment day as he directs us in his word, then we get a taste of that joy and blessing that that great day will bring us, but we get the taste of it today. Jesus' disciples in Matthew chapter 25 were curious about what his return and the end of the world was going to be like, and why not? Uh, we're curious about it still today. We'd all like to know exactly what's going to happen on that day, what it's going to feel and look like, and there are many pictures in the Bible word pictures to encourage us and to make us think about that day and to give us examples of what it will be. We know that day is coming soon and the events that have happened in 2020 just remind us that that day could come at any time. In these verses from Matthew, Matthew chapter 25, it's Jesus and his disciples on Tuesday of Holy Week. So we're three days before Jesus died on the cross. And Jesus is talking about his upcoming death with his disciples and his return to his heavenly Father. But he promised them during that week many times that he was going to come back and take them to be with him in heaven. But Jesus told those disciples, he warned them, and he warns us too, that while Jesus is gone, terrible destruction was going to take place. There in Jerusalem, he warned them, terrible things were going to happen, and it did. Jerusalem was destroyed 40 years later. Jesus also said that there would be wars and rumors of wars and famines and earthquakes and pestilences in various places. And yes, hurricanes, epidemics, riots, and wildfires, those would definitely qualify for that list. But if you flip through a history textbook, the list of these signs that Jesus talks about of him coming back, they've never stopped. There's never been a time when they were not going on. Jesus said also that while he was gone, his followers were going to be persecuted and hated wherever they went and preached the gospel. And we can see very clearly that this is happening around the world today. 
Since these things are happening to us each and every day, that we see these signs around us in the news, in the world around us, it's maybe a little bit surprising then that unbelievers scoff at the notion that God is going to fulfill his word and Jesus will come back just like he says in the Bible. Or they take these events that are happening, the fight, wildfires, earthquakes, famines, and so forth, and they blame them on climate change. And again, I'm not trying to get political here. I'm not saying the climate is not changing. But when we point only at climate change, we're missing something. If God said these things are going to happen to prepare for his coming, he wants us not to think about how we can better manage uh, not just to think about how we can better manage fossil fuels, but how we can repent of our sins and prepare for him to come and bring this world to an end. Everything that Jesus prophesied in these signs has happened in these last days. It's as though we have a map, a road map right in front of us, and we're driving looking out the windows of the car, and we're seeing the landmarks that are listed on the map passing us as we go. We know that we're getting closer and closer. And yet the people around us, as Paul said in our second lesson, continue to say, peace and safety. We're fine. Everything's okay. They go on living their normal lives without any thought of the destruction that can and will overtake them at any moment and Jesus says that's just the way things were back in the days of Noah right right before the worldwide flood and also in Noah like it, it was in Noah's day many people deny that God would send such a great destruction and destroy millions of people most Americans today including many who b say they believe what the Bible says don't think that God would ever condemn people to eternal fire, as he clearly says he will do in these words from Matthew chapter 25. Again, we look back at the flood, people thinking that God wouldn't destroy millions of people or, or many, many people back then. It didn't stop God from keeping his word. But we need to watch out. Because that attitude of the world around us, that attitude that, ah, who knows if it's going to happen or it couldn't possibly happen, that attitude is contagious. Even Bible-believing baptized Christians are guilty of living our days in pursuit of the comforts and pleasures that this life has to offer, spending our time serving our own desires, piling up stuff that the Bible tells us is going to be completely destroyed in short order, and avoiding the instructions that God has given us for the things we should be doing to anticipate his coming on the last day. That's sin, pure and simple. Going out and doing the things we want to do and denying or refusing or putting way down on the totem pole the priorities that God tells us we should have. God didn't make us to live to serve ourselves, and he didn't remake us as his new creatures to do that either. We had better keep in mind that that great judgment day is coming because you know what? In our text, it doesn't say if the Lord comes. It says when the Son of Man comes in all his glory and all his angels with him. He will sit on his glorious throne and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. Even if we don't always live like it, we who trust the unfailing word of God know and believe that this will happen soon. And everyone wants to be among the sheep on Jesus' right side when that day arrives. And how do you get to be among the sheep? Well, that's easy. You be a sheep. And how do you know if you are a sheep? Well, that's easy too. The Bible tells us very clearly. Jesus says, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. Jesus' voice that he's talking about is his word, the Bible. The Bible that we hear here at church in our worship services, at home, as we read our Bibles, in our family devotions, in the voice of a pastor or a parent or a teacher 
who lovingly points us to Jesus as our Savior and corrects us when we are wrong and calls us to repentance. The sheep are those who have been forgiven, who have been brought into the fold of God's church by baptism. What do you have to do to be among the sheep on the last day? It isn't about what you do. You don't do anything to be a sheep. Being a sheep is who you are. You are one of Jesus' little lambs. You are forgiven. You are saved. Jesus knows who his sheep are and who are not his sheep. So this picture that we have of Judgment Day, you'll notice that there's no test on the last day. There's no purification that you have to go through. There's no obstacle that you have to cross over like some raging river and you have to bring your coin and, and pay the, the ferryman so you can get to the other side and only a few are going to make it. It's very simple. Jesus puts the sheep, his sheep on his right and the rest on his left. And our good shepherd makes no mistakes. He will not get mixed up. He will not accidentally put you in the wrong group. But even though Jesus knows who are his without even saying a word, still look what Jesus does in our gospel lesson. He proves to everyone standing before him that he has made the right decision and brought the right, the correct sheep into the fold by pointing to the evidence of our works, feeding the hungry, giving the thirsty a drink, being hospitable to others, giving clothes to those is in need, caring for the sick and for those who are in prison. But then on top of pointing to our good works, the Lord gives a great honor to those acts of service that his believers have done towards others. He says, whatever you did for the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. And Jesus associates himself so intimately with our good works that he, he says, you actually did these things to me. I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty. I needed clothes, and you did this for me. Can you imagine that you as a believer, motivated by thanks and love for the Lord and all that he has done for you, motivated by his love in your heart, that you have actually aided our Lord and done things to help him in his need. It seems almost mind-boggling. You gave him food while he was hungry. You visited him and took care of him when he was sick. You provided clothes for him to wear. You worked long hours so that you'd be able to put food on the table and provide him with a good education. You helped him carry his groceries up the front steps. You helped him shovel the snow off of his sidewalk. You forgave your brother or sister when they sinned against you. You showed love to your spouse or your children or your parents even when they weren't all that lovable. You studied for that test so that you could do the best that you could even though you didn't get a good grade. You worked hard even when your boss or your teacher wasn't watching. Your Savior, who sees everything, saw you do those things, and he will tell the entire world on the last day, he or she did these things for me. He also gives evidence on the other side of the coin. He gives evidence of the goat's lack of faith by showing that they didn't love and serve God in their lives. In fact, they refused every opportunity to serve the Lord, now, unbelievers may do some pretty awesome and pretty wonderful, remarkable, selfless things. Feeding starving children, donating to pure, cure cancer, fighting for our country, giving blood, and so forth. But if it wasn't done out of love for Jesus, God says it's repulsive in his sight. In fact, the Apostle Paul says everything that doesn't come from faith is sin. It's not evidence of faith without love for the Savior in our hearts. And once Jesus points to that evidence, notice there's no arguing. All the unbelievers have to agree, I didn't do anything out of love for Jesus. And the believers, on the other hand, will be just shocked 
that the mighty king on his throne thinks so highly of these little things that we didn't think that much about, that we did in faith towards others. He noticed, and he praises us for doing them. And then on that last day, the Lord himself from his throne will give you the most wonderful command you've ever heard. Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take the inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. An inheritance isn't something that you can earn. Again, it's given to you because of who you are. An inheritance can't even really be taken, or at least it shouldn't be. It can only be given and received. On that last day, the day that we're looking forward to, God will give you his kingdom, not just a room in it, the kingdom that he has prepared for you that's been waiting for your arrival since Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden. Think of the paradise that God created for Adam and Eve, and Adam and Eve there. It had everything that they could ever need. The book of Revelation tells us that the kingdom that we're looking forward to in heaven has everything that we could ever need as well. And all of this is not just some hope, some wish that you have for the future. It belongs to you right now. It had your name on it already at the time God finished with creation. It was, the, it was yours the day that God brought you to faith. Your inheritance belongs to you today because God made you his child and his heir at the same time. Jesus said, looking ahead to that judgment day, I tell you the truth, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He has crossed over from death to life. It's yours already. Heaven belongs to you. You have a rightful claim to your inheritance by faith in Jesus' atoning death and his resurrection. But God doesn't want that joy and that anticipation, that expectation of that eternal home in heaven to die and fade away just moments from now. He wants to draw out that joy so that you experience it every day of your life until he comes again. And he wants to draw it out by active expectation of that day that we would live our lives joyfully following our good shepherd who has given all of this to us, gladly obeying his commands to love listening and studying God's word, looking for opportunities to show the love that God has put into our hearts by serving one another. Paul, in one of his letters to Timothy, instructed him as a pastor to command believers to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasures for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is really, truly life. Don't let your anticipation of heaven be dragged down into the rat race of this life. Instead, fill your days with true lasting joy by preparing for that great day to come. Then every act of service you will see as a joyful gift to your Lord, even if people around you don't seem to appreciate it. Then you will take hold of that living that is truly life. And every day of your life, whether it's a good day filled with joy and happiness or a bad day filled with sorrow and heartache, every day is one step closer to your eternal home. Amen. Please stand. And may God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Amen. Thank you for watching today's worship service from St. Matthew's Lutheran Church in Stoddard. Join us for worship at church or watch our live stream Sunday mornings at 9 on Facebook and YouTube. God's blessings.